Hello and welcome back to Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. Hey guys, today I have a hypnotherapist with me and a trauma specialist with me whose name is Chris Paprapni. Now I have been struggling with pronouncing your name a little bit, Chris, but hello and thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? I'm not too bad. It's great to be here and uh, obviously given the opportunity to speak to your uh, guests about obviously a topic that is trauma related and um, clearly the implications that that has on it's, obviously the original event and obviously the rest of their lives so it um yeah it's great does. to be here it genuinely does and that's something i'm always trying to get clients to understand if you are still struggling at an advanced stage into adulthood with some traumatic emotional injuries that began in childhood please don't think you're weak you just have a really core wound to yourself that needs to be taken care of, tended to, understood and healed and kept in mind as you move forward. So Chris is again, certified trauma specialist. He's a hypnotherapist. And for about four years now, he has been doing trauma-informed life coaching and hypnotherapy. Hey, Chris, can you tell me what hypnotherapy entails? Because it's not something I've had a great deal of experience with. I know that it works with reprogramming your mind's responses by implanting suggestions. Is there anything else that I need to know about it that would be helpful for the audience to know? Yeah, so hypnotherapy um, obviously has a load of societal um, kind of uh, fluff to it. So obviously you've seen probably um, scripts or videos whereby you have people instantly going into like hypnosis and then you get them running around like a fire hydrant or acting like a dog. It's like what you have to realize is that's called like staged hypnotherapy. So it's designed to kind of put people off doing the actual work, which is the hypnotherapy, which is done by the specialists. Mm -hmm. But when we look at hypnotherapy from a specialist point of view, all we're basically doing is giving you um, an altered state of consciousness. So what we're doing is we're shutting off the prefrontal cortex, which is the thinking part of the brain or the conscious element of the brain so that we can access the subconscious programming behind. So when you go into hypnosis, you're kind of walked through kind of downstairs or across a beach. And the idea is to relax that thinking part of the brain. And then there's an element of um, people will probably say, well, am I in control? And the answer is you're always in control. So it's not as though we take you to some altered state of consciousness, then we brainwash you um, by putting you into like a trance state. It's, it's the total opposite. The idea behind it is to access um, elements of ourselves that we've kind of had locked, hidden away, or had um, issues whereby we couldn't cope or process with them from a nervous system perspective as a younger child. This can also relate to past lives. So that's a bit more of the esoteric side, but I've had a couple of dealings with um, people that have had past lives carry into this life and they've met people and there's environments. So it's a case of we can access elements that we wouldn't necessarily get if you were having just a general day to day conversation. And then subsequently, that's part of the lessons in life and then the healing and the growth and the development that then comes from the individual as they piece their um, kind of aspects of self-realization and self-actualization together. And then their purpose then becomes filling sort of more of themselves with themselves. So where you have karma so, and dharma and things like that can then sort of play out. Um, so what we need to kind of differentiate between is the idea that some people confuse brainwashing, where like on July 15th, you will murder the president type of thing that we see in movies. It's all very sensationalized and dramatized. And, but there is a role for hypnotherapy in helping people access their unconscious responses and having new ones programmed in to help them access the healing and the learning and the techniques that they have been. So it can be added into a process. Now, I have not personally found that hypnotherapy takes the place of all other forms of therapy, but I'm always trying to get people to understand, diversify, reach out to more forms of healing, of spirituality. And if you take kind of a shotgun approach to it, you're more likely to get the answers that are right for you. Because the way that I approach this uh, is that all paths to healing and the divine are valid and different people will be called to different answers. Your particular approach is going to appeal very much to people who like to approach things logically and analytically in order to contain, to kind of uh, gain control of their emotional response system. The greater perspective that comes in with doing shadow work, and I looked at your YouTube channel. Guys, he doesn't have a lot of followers yet, but check out his YouTube channel because he has good videos on shadow work, which shadow work is part of our personality that was formed in trauma. Hey, so 
Tell me the difference from your understanding between complex post-traumatic stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, because there is an application for hypnotherapy in learning to overcome emotional triggers, is there not? Yes. So when we look at um, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, what we're looking at is a situation in time whereby our nervous system wasn't able to cope with what we were being dealt with. So this can happen pretty much at any point during life. It could be accidents, um, it could be like being at war, it could be um, some event that literally comes out the blue. So like you're in a car crash or there's some um, element that then comes into play and the nervous system in that moment doesn't have the facility to obviously deal and process with that emotion. So you'll be put into a state of fight or flight And then what will happen is you'll instantly be put into a freeze state as a result of that fight or flight. So what we instantly get from the nervous system perspective is it's like um, there's strings on the yo-yo and you're kind of being pulled back and forward. And then because you're not in a position whereby you can rest and digest or get to a state of calm, whereas like in the animal kingdom, they will go back to like the herd and then they will shake it off and it will be released from all of the um, the bodywork elements. We as humans then have to do dinner, then do homework or watch programs or go to bed or then get up and go to work. And it's like we don't ever have that downtime to then process. So because we're then not completing that loop, it sits with us over time and then plays out in other situations like it might then become your boss is then the person that then triggers the ptsd or it might be the partner that you're with that then triggers the ptsd whereas when we look at more complex ptsd we're kind of going more back to childhood so we're at a stage whereby zero to seven is usually your developmental years So if you receive during that period, and this is where I always go back, if I do like cork therapy or if I do language or if I do hypnotherapy, I always go back to zero to seven because that's the critical developmental stage. And what then happens is you get cross of, you're trying to learn to exist and survive in an environment. However, if there's a trauma or your needs aren't met or you have some form of Um, safety or lapse in security and you don't feel as though you're able to process which to be fair generationally you kind of don't have these things passed down as coping mechanisms because everybody has different ways of dealing with things but then these form lessons in life but because you haven't then got that sturdy foundation in childhood in the developmental years then you have the complex PTSD because usually you'll get some type of acute trauma at the same time, be it sort of um, verbal abuse or be it conflict. And then these basically compound the layers of what you're dealing with in terms of the stress and the trauma. And because not a lot of people sit there and go, well, how do the kids feel or how does this look from their perspective? You find that the child then has two options. So they've got option one, they're unsafe. But can you imagine living the rest of your life if you were thinking you were unsafe? It just, it doesn't quite make sense. So what they then have to do is make themselves unsafe, but then they create a survival adaptation, which then becomes the identity away from the core wound, which is why it then becomes complex, because you've now got a gatekeeper Mm -hmm. that is protecting this wounded child. So you're kind of bandaging it, but you're not allowing it to air and you're not allowing it to heal. Whereas then the other option is you make your parents or your guardians or your primary carers unsafe, in which case you're going to constantly be living in an environment which once again is fight or flight and it like, alleviates all of the tension and all of the stress con- like continuously. And because you're then looking at it from that perspective, you're kind of in a catch-22 And you then have to internalize it, which is then why we get the complex PTSD, because it then starts dealing with the mental side, the emotional side and the physical side over time. Um, Here's something that like, because I do deal with uh, lots of people who have CPTSD because I deal with people who are sexually abused, emotionally abused, Mm -hmm. bullied, neglected. Neglect is a very potent form of abuse as well. And what I'm always trying to get people to understand is if you are struggling with triggers and with dissociation in your adult relationships and when you are feeling unsafe, 
The reason that you have a disproportionate response is that more emotion is coming to the table than the situation warrants because you have tapped in into that formative damage into those original traumatic wounds. And as you said, a gatekeeper, a part of your personality that does seem like a different part of you. It's like you, you, you only need it when the triggers come out does come forward and it is trying to protect you just as denial is a protective device within the mind trying to help us not confront things that we cannot handle at a time triggers are actually trying to protect us we simply have to learn new methods techniques and sometimes in the case of hypnotherapy an implanted suggestion that will help you access your coping techniques that you must acquire in adult life in order to be able to have thriving relationships in order to be able to have a good relationship with self as well. Hey Chris, where do you suggest people start when they are trying to embark on a healing journey? I'm in the US, you are in the UK, as I'm sure everybody can yep. tell from your accent, you're in the UK. <laughs> and we, we have a different system here that makes it more difficult for people to get the help that they need sometimes. So what is your mm -hmm. kind of blanket or general advice to people who potentially cannot get to a certified therapist because insurance bars them from that? What are your suggestions for self-care and for self-healing that people can undertake as they go forward to try and deal with these? So a lot of this boils down to the simple act of compassion and non-judgment. So what we have to realize is these events have already happened. So because they've already happened, we can't change them from a physical experience perspective. But what we can do is we can change how we react to them. And what we then look at is the reaction or the reacting is the trauma. So it's not the event that happened. It's the continuous playing of the event because there's something we either don't understand or there's something that we've misinterpreted or there's a piece of our puzzle or our self that we've kind of not incorporated that we need to go back and we need to learn that lesson in order to then become more whole in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So then what we then have is because you're then working on that principle and concept, we have to do the self-work, the self-healing, and it is going to involve looking at the shadow aspects. But the brilliant thing that I found with like the system or the matrix as a whole, if you want to refer to it as that, mm -hmm. is that in society, all of our relationships are mirrors of our relationship to ourselves. So if you sit back and rather than blaming and projecting onto people, just have a look at what is this showing me like in the moment. And if you have a look, I think it's the um, seven scene mirrors. Mm -hmm. If you go and research those, you'll see that like there's a mother father dynamic. There's a what you've lost, given, had, taken away. And there's all these other concepts that bring you back to self. And you can kind of then, if you can separate from the situation and the emotion, which is difficult because emotion will always be logic. So it's just a case of going back and reviewing it and going, actually, how can I parent myself better? Because what I needed at the time wasn't there, but I'm still acting from when that original wound or trauma. So you could be acting from the age of like a three-year-old at the age of 93. Yeah. and you haven't kind of unraveled all of these like different angles and perspectives so that's where i'd start i'd have a, a sit down with yourself in a nice calm environment then sit and review exactly what's playing out and then have a look at how that is reflecting on your side and where there's an element of you that kind of is doing the same thing but don't judge it have compassion and then obviously sit and then work through it to try and get back to some period between zero and seven where um, it originally started. A tool that I have found that can really help, and it helped me, is that eventually you get to a point where if you hear the circumstances of another person, if you're reading a news item, if you're seeing a story on TV, you will react to it with less judgment and more compassion based on the circumstances. Learn to do that for yourself. Look at yourself as a person. You can no longer reach that person in time directly. So look at that person as somebody that you're reading the biography on and you would understand that their reactions and the way that they approach the world is understandable because of the environment in which they were raised. And when I'm talking to people about the head and the heart battle, you always want to get the head in there because having the information is one of the keys to unlocking your trauma and understanding it and being able to cope with it and being able to manage it. If you did not grow 
grow up with any physical safety around you, you may have a disproportionate anger response when you feel threatened is one of the examples that I try to get people to understand. I use tarot, tarot can be used to look at the past, the present and the future. I use tarot to look at somebody's internal world as well to help them start opening those doors and look in the rooms that they have closed off, which is what happens when people develop triggers. They close a door and they do appoint a gatekeeper to that particular room. Don't go in there. That's where my anger and my fear is. We have to learn how to understand our responses in order to gain control over them. And as you said, approaching self with path compassion is also very helpful. You're also a Reiki healer, are you not? I am, yeah. I, I trained a couple of years ago, um, one, two, and master teacher, I believe it was. So obviously a lot of my um, kind of overall uh, bearing in mind, I do like holistic um, alternative therapies, but as you kind of hinted earlier, it's like hypnotherapy is one modality, mm -hmm. but we've got like Reiki for that side, but then you've got talk therapy, you've got, there's a place for pretty much everything. Um, but I combine all of it from a structural perspective. I work from the physical back into the emotional, back into the mental, and then I align obviously the energetics. Um, so that obviously my method that I use is complete and I know there's no kind of shrapnel as it were that's going to come back and kind of haunt you from a limiting belief or a mindset perspective. Mm -hmm. So I kind of adopt that approach through, through my methods. Now, this may be incorrect, and feel free to correct me if it is not correct mm -hmm. on this, because I'm not a Reiki healer. I'm an energy healer. There's a very slight difference. You have to train with a Reiki master to be considered a Reiki master. My personal belief is that none of the energetic healing or the healing frequencies can do the work for you, but what it can do is lessen the emotional and energetic impact of the emotions that you're having and the work that you're doing. So it's almost like taking a great big vitamin, or I guess you would say vitamin. You, it's almost like taking yep. a supplement to try and help you get the best results possible. And that's what the diversification of different healing techniques can bring to you, is that going back and doing that core work can be very, very difficult for people. And it is best done with a trained therapist. You are a, a licensed therapist. Um, mm -hmm. It is best done with a trained therapist because they can help keep you safe during that process. And one of the other things, if you do not have the means nor the access to a therapist that can help you, is doing the energetic work. When, you, when we're talking about Reiki, is there a particular form of Reiki that someone who is working on unpacking their trauma so that they can have better and more satisfying relationships in the year and now, what Reiki should they approach? Is it a root chakra issue? How do you do this? So you can kind of, you can go to pretty much any um, kind of Reiki practitioner. They will have different adaptations to how they do stuff. But a lot of it is more around moving like energies in the body. Mm -hmm. So what we find is the body stores the energy and what we're doing is we're opening up the channels, the meridians and like getting the chi or the life force energy to flow better through the system. So you might find this has um, like spinal um, relations in which case there's a lot of stuff stored in the structure but you can also have it so that you can clear top to bottom and you've then got um, kind of energies getting stored in like certain areas like the shoulders where you carry a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind the energy clearing from that perspective is to start it flowing. So what then happens is we have to then look at like emotion, i.e. energy in motion, which is an outward force, which is kind of what we want to do. We want to be expressing ourselves so that we're not storing it in the body. Whereas what we're talking about is more feelings that are stuck, trapped, unprocessed. So they're very much stagnant. So the whole point of like Reiki or even if you do something like acupuncture or something along those lines, it's designed to get the flow moving. And then once we get that emotional flow moving, it starts triggering all these memories that are coming up. But a lot of people then get frightened at that stage because they're either on their own or they've been triggered or they're not in a safe environment. And then they close them off again. So the emotion then becomes a feeling and then it gets trapped and then you repeat that process. But as we had adhered to earlier, it's about giving ourselves that space and that compassion to literally feel and complete that cycle. So going to a Reiki healer will move the energy and then we're going to get processing as like off the back of that. 
Um, one of the things that you pointed out is that people can become overwhelmed because they are not feeling safe. And that is one of the things that applying these different modalities can help you learn how to establish a feeling of your own safety. Because the best thing that a trauma survivor can do is to learn how to stop repressing their feelings. And what happens in people who grow up in traumatic circumstances, particularly from that formative stage from zero to seven, is if they have learned that they are with someone, a caregiver, who is potentially not a safe person half the time through their own generational trauma. Remember, most of the people who have inflicted damage simply were acting from their own, their place of their own wounds. And the, one of the kind of the uh, roles of applying these different things is to amass a toolkit to address your emotions because you are going to be safest and have the best relationships and the most thriving outcomes when you are able to care for yourself and emotionally regulate without emotional repression. You had referred to something that I find fascinating. Across the shoulders is where we have a tendency to share our burdens. How about different areas of the body, like hips that I understand are frequently about grief and other things that you're holding back. Are there any energy points in the body that people should be focusing on, perhaps their throat, being able to communicate, it doesn't work like that because chakras do. And I know that there's a relationship between Reiki and chakras, but it's not direct. Yeah, so obviously the chakra system is just our energetic alignment. And as you go through each of the centers, like the root will be your basic need. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that um, kind of if you're having stability issues in terms of like money, then it will be in like the basic needs. If you don't have like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, i.e. warmth, shelter and all these like food and things like that, then you'll find it flares up in that region. And that's all like if you look at the hip as a kind of unit, it's all about stability. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of understand then kind of why that is kind of that section itself. Um, grief can show up in many places. It occasionally comes up in the lungs because obviously it's a it's a life force. Obviously, when you breathe in and you take in oxygen, it comes into the lung area and then it's taking in life. So when you have grief, it's a loss of life. So it can then cause any sort of um, physical ailment with regards to the lungs and the autonomic nervous system, which is the heart and the lungs. So it can show up in various places and you will also find that these places are technically relevant to you and they become part of like a puzzle piece so if it's generational and you've suffered with grief and you've never processed it or dealt with it you might find that it's stored in the arm but then that arm reference relates to um kind of a war or battle that like somebody two or three generations thought but there was a problem whereby they got wounded in that stage and then they weren't able to grieve it properly and then it gets passed genetically through, which is why we say it's genetics, but it's actually just unresolved trauma yes. stored cellularly. Um, but somebody at some point then has to pick it up and clear it. But then if we go through the chakra system, you then get into like the creation center, then the third one's the power center, then we get more heartfelt, which is love then obviously you've got the throat in terms of expression. So it depends what the trauma is and where it gets stored based on each of these regions and how it corresponds to the bigger picture. So if you've been suppressed and you're not able to talk, chances are you'll get thyroid issues. So that's where there's a block in that chakra center, but it's showing in the throat. So like you were saying, it's it's it, there is a core structure to it which is the spinal column and the chakras. But then you also get other areas where it can be stored due to past trauma because it goes into the soma and the muscles. Um, you were talking about something that I would like to draw a little bit more attention to, um, which is that as you uh, address things, you may find that there are more <laughs> things behind them. Meaning that healing, Jacob Jacob is a friend of mine who does the majority of the episodes with me because we're always talking about these very weighty topics. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we're always talking about is that healing is not a straight line and it's not a destination. You don't reach a state of being healed. You reach a state of having the tools in your personal toolkit that you need 
to remain fully functional and in the best regulated state that you can be and that you will backslide and that you will occasionally bump into things that you weren't aware were there. And that happens all the time in trauma processing. And that is one of the roles, as I understand it, that hypnotherapy can help people with, which is uncovering the things that they overwhelmed by them, kind of walled off like, you know, Montressor, <laughs> like behind that, yeah. behind that brick wall lies more and more issues. What does hypnotherapy do in helping people find the things that they have buried? So when we have the original event, we develop a survival adaptation for that event. So that's then when the brick wall comes up. But then what we're looking with hypnotherapy is we're looking to get all instances or movie clips or visuals or scenarios that are linked to that survival adaptation. So these were the played out over various um, kind of points in your life, but we live it linear. But when we look back on it, it could have been created zero to seven, then eight to 14. And then the third instance could be like 14 to 25. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking to do is collect all of those bits of information because they're the different angles and the different viewpoints that guide us back to the original trauma so that we can eventually get to look at it because ultimately the body wants to heal. It wants to be in a state of balance. And like you say, there's many onion layers to these things. And we embark on the journey of self-discovery, but we have to drop all the baggage that isn't ours. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind the hypnotherapy is to then get these snippets that are then conscious in our minds so that we can connect them together, even though they're years apart. Then when we make that connection, it's like archiving a file. It's like, it's now complete. Now do we understand what this was, why it's there, what it was showing us, what element of ourself was disconnected. And then we go on beyond that to then reprogram it. So like it might be self-value, self-worth, in which case we instill beliefs that then fill that void because we've now parked that issue. So we then fill it more with you and who you want to be rather than who you thought you were that you weren't. Now, so hopefully that answers. Yeah, it actually really does. Um, what's your process when you meet a new client? Do you sit down and talk to them about your past or do you go into a hypnotherapy session? What is it that you do when you have somebody new on board? So a lot of my stuff at the minute has um, tended to go a bit more away from hypnotherapy. So mm -hmm. the reason the reason for that is because I don't need that to get them the result that they need. So I will find that people now are coming with um, kind of current life um, scenarios, but I can walk them through based on what they're telling me exactly how they've structured it in the same way I would get the same information from hypnotherapy. The difference now is hypnotherapy could be two or three hours of a session and then we walk through and we connect the dots. Whereas now within about half hour, I can pretty much work out questioning and where we need to go. And then you're going to probably end up just telling me all of the scenarios that I need anyway, which is brilliant because it cut down the amount of time that we need to look at in order to gather all the information and then piece the jigsaw together. So a lot of the stuff, even if it's physical conditioning, like these physical elements and understanding them, we can then work that all the way back to then get you energetically aligned through reworking the emotional and the mental side. So you get the emotional release during the session, you then get the mental processing and rewiring, which you'd also get in hypnotherapy. But I found a way of um, kind of instilling concepts and then getting to the point a lot quicker. And then a lot of it is to do with obviously my own skill set and my interpretation, but it's a lot more efficient than technically using hypnotherapy. But then that's that's one of my other modalities that I can then incorporate if I have to do. But the idea is to give um, an efficient sort of um, resolution to the issue. Okay. Chris, what drew you to this particular line of work? Because most of the people that I find who are working in being trauma specialists or trying to help trauma survivors specifically, usually were either adjacent to a trauma traumatic situation that formed them or they experienced trauma themselves. So without like trying to like, you know, uh, violate your boundaries or anything, what's the passion? <laughs> Um, so I started out actually in accountancy. So I was dealing with like 10,000 odd lines of random bits of data and finding problems. So that's kind of where I learned my problem solving skills. Um, I then got to a position about five years ago where I had a sense of depersonalization and derealization, which I refer to now as like a secondary part of my spiritual awakening. 
Um, so then I started seeing things differently and noticing that obviously what I'd always been told was actually the opposite of what it was. So I started then doing my own internal work and um, I came across a lot of my own stuff from like a people pleasing aspect, um, a service to others aspect where it was kind of heightened. So it was not balanced in that sense. It was kind of one extreme. And then the more I looked into it and I was getting into relationships, I was then finding that I was attracting people who had like childhood wounds. Mm -hmm. So like my um, first partner was very much uh, kind of her parents split up from childhood. So you're missing one of these parent dynamics, which then allows you to work out roughly where the midpoint is to base a relationship on. But then moving beyond that, she had sexual abuse um, towards sort of her teen years. And then when you kind of understand that, I kind of got into the whole, well, why is all this happening? And I kind of got inquisitive with it. Okay. So because of like my people pleasing side, I got drawn to the trauma and I was stuck in trauma bonds. And it kind of led to a position whereby then I attracted another relationship and then I found out that she was sexually abused by her dad at the age of seven. But we've now split because she wasn't kind of willing to do the work in terms of the shadow side to then understand it all which is perfectly fine we have free will we have choices it's like you've got the option as to what you then tend it's to do with it it's called karmic partner it's called being karmic. yeah exactly so um in that in those two like karmic relationships we then had kids which are obviously soul ties mm -hmm. and that the idea behind that is so that they can then resolve those traumas but then i kind of got to the position whereby it's like I'm here to help people. I'm a master 11 number, so I'm meant to do humanitarian type service work and be a guide, which is in alignment with who I am. Um, but it was literally that realization that like you have pain, which is a given, right? So it's growing pains and it's called growing pains for a reason. So we have to go through those pains. Whereas the idea of suffering is optional. It's a choice. And because I've seen, obviously, what's then happened to some of these women that I've had associations with, I now have a skill set that allows me to stop that suffering. So what I'm then doing is obviously putting that now out into the world so that if there are people that are unnecessarily suffering, that they have an option that isn't necessarily available in society. We're not coping with these things. We're not managing them. We're getting to the root cause and we're clearing out all of the bunk that we kind of have gathered over the years that isn't ours to be kind of um, begin with. And then that unison then comes back to creating the uh, the whole process. Well, the, one of the reasons it's such an exciting time to be alive is that we are uh, understanding of things like addiction. Addiction is quite frequently a trauma response. We have a, we have a tendency to put it down to genetics. It is most likely a trauma response versus simple genetics. Um, there are ways to approach everything now that are deepening in sophistication and nuance. Our understanding of what a difficult backstory in your childhood had has evolved over the last decade or so. And then the odd good silver lining of COVID was that there was this unifying event in which most people experienced a, you know, a sudden traumatic event where their lives were kind of like taken out from underneath them. And it had a tendency to tap into their unresolved trauma from their own childhood. And it does give us the opportunity to improve our emotional and our energetic health by accessing the trauma of the past so that we can have better outcomes in the future. And that is what all of this work really is about. Hey, Chris, a couple of things that I saw on your website and in, with your channel and on your TikTok, because I checked them all out, was you yep. do ap appear to understand that there is a physical component in terms of being fit and taking good care of yourself, that working in all, when we're talking about a holistic approach, diet, mm -hmm. exercise, all of those things are great mood regulators. What do you suggest for people in that area? So if we're looking at like general physical health, the body is going to be like a device that feeds back to you. I mean, we look at it as this vessel that we are but we don't ever look at it from a perspective of we're like a spiritual being living a temporary human existence. So when we take that step back and we look at the body, then we can look at it from a perspective of how aligned are we? Are we tired? Are we fatigued? It's like all of these things are kind of cues that something is out of alignment. Mm -hmm. And what we're then doing is there's no one size fits all. There's a, 
a kind of a stage that we get to, and it's interesting because I was talking about this the other day. A lot of people will go to the gym in order to look good, but the reason they're going is to look good because there's a vanity aspect in behind it that then obviously has a trauma behind it, which then goes to some unresolved issue. Whereas what we're looking at getting to is a position whereby each individual can find what works for them, without a trauma response that needs to be fed or met and lesson based. That you're going to the gym just because you get to, just because you're blessed to be able to go to the gym, not because you're looking for a desired outcome that's based on kind of tending to a trauma. So, or, or seeking the validation from an exterior exactly. versus from an yeah. interior place of loving and caring for oneself, because that is actually the key to having the best relationship. Because everybody starts out healing to try and feel better, but they also want better relationships with other people. And the way to do that is to start having an excellent caretaking relationship with oneself, which does mm -hmm. include self care. That includes. Taking fitness to the level that is appropriate for you in your physical body and to understand any challenges that you have were brought to you not as a form of you're not uniquely afflicted, nothing's out to get you. It's there to try and help teach you a lesson about how you are best cared for because we are spiritual beings here having a physical experience and nothing about that physical experience is a true accident, which can be very overwhelming for people who have difficult backstories because it's like, why would I do that to myself? Because your spiritual self understands that there are many lessons to be learned in those burdens and those were the things the parts of the knowledge that you came here to acquire and being able to work in all of those different we, we, we call it balancing the elements what we're talking about has a lot of earth in it i'm clearly very into the idea of examine it from what is known in uh, the realm of psychology and in neuroscience and you're going to have a much better result than if you just stick with the narrative around things like light workers and a couple of other things, which I'm not being dismissive towards. I'm just saying that that is part of an answer for some people and it will be the answer for some people, but that it works best if you begin tying it into the mental energy of analysis that we're talking about, the practical energy of earth, which is what we're talking about with robust physical self-care in the 3D and other things that have to do with our 3D relationships, which kind of form the bulk of our emotional experience while we're here. The water element is our emotions, which all of those two things will help you deal with that one much better. And then the last one would be fire, which are the actions that we take and the impulses that we follow through on in the 3D. And one of the best roles in healing is learning how to take that fire and turn it not into something that is endlessly defending you, but rather something that is there to guard you if you need it, but mostly guide your experience forward because part of prospering is growing and moving forward always. Now, Chris, one of the things that I found in like looking at your stuff was that you do take this very 3D approach and also incorporate spirituality. What do you think the role of spirituality is in healing? So it comes back to the earlier point. It's like we are spiritual beings. So technically we're just energy. Mm -hmm. and we're having this human experience. So what we have to do is we have to take the spiritual concepts and we have to bring them down to earth in, in a sense. So you know when they say it's like heaven on earth, that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. So if you look at it from a place of the head, you've got H-E-A-D, mm -hmm. but you've also got H-E-A in heaven. But mm -hmm. then if you look at the heel, it's H-E-E-L, but then that's L. So you've kind of got the body in a heaven and hell bringing heaven to earth and getting away from the hell aspect while we're kind of in this earth plane. So the reason I use the spiritual elements and the concepts is because they're going to be aligned from the higher perspective. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, how do we get that highest perspective knowledge into a lower level perspective that's understandable and applicable for the masses so that then everybody can incorporate that and then because it is spiritual and you are a spirit in essence then you're technically going back to your roots you're going back to who you are and you're going back to concepts and principles that are aligned and then all we're doing is we're just bringing that into the 3d physical existence in order to then better manage the the it'll be density more than anything it's like it's really dense and heavy here we're not floaty we're not like 
spiritual we're energy but we're in a physical defined body that is dense which is why we feel the emotions which is why we have the mental constructs because they're more dense than the spiritual aspect and then the physical is is clearly as dense as it's going to get so it's about reducing that density hence it's called enlightenment because we're increasing and ascending through all these energies to get back to source or who we are at source so that's kind of why i incorporate the spiritual into the um to the physical realm from that perspective. Now, when we talk about something like hell, hell, uh, like it's not something that I believe in, um, but it is something that relates to our tendency to suffer because of our attachment to our emotions, which is completely natural. And here's the thing. I don't actually advise people to completely detach in the way that a lot of spiritual leaders can, simply because if you detach entirely, hey, you're only here for a finite amount of time. While you're here, be here experience things at the level that you can while you're here because joy exists in attachment as well love exists in attachment as well it is managing your level of attachment to make sure that it is not detrimental to your emotional and your spiritual well-being that is the entire goal of marrying these concepts together spirituality with the practicality with psychology with things having to do with your physicality as well it is not to eradicate one area but to find the balance or the center point within that allows you to experience this life as we are having it at the best level that you can possibly achieve while you are here. But to never lose sight of the fact that there is more to this. The first tenet of faith is that this there is more to this existence than we can see. And do not take an approach to faith, my personal advice is do not take an approach to faith that is solely based in religion. Religion, I'm always saying, is a power structure. It is man-made. It was uh, something that took advantage of the idea of connection and of faith. The, if you look at all major religions, they're mostly giving the same messages over and over again, and it is because there is a core truth in those beliefs. If you are somebody who is a faithful person and you approach it through religion, I am not saying such a religion aside, but to understand that there is a difference between between the man-made structure that is the 3D energy of the religion and the elemental, the air and the water and all of the other things that go into your connection to source, which that religion is a stairway to source, but it is not source itself. And that is something to remember as well. Hey, Chris, do you have one piece of advice for people who are suffering and they are of limited means? What's the thing to reach out for, the re free resource? Because I'm always trying to find free resources for people as well, simply because it is delightful if you have the means to hire a healer like Chris or like myself. But if you don't, you shouldn't be barred from the idea of emotional wellness. What is your recommendation for the free resources that are out there? Yeah, so... I'm very much of the belief um, this is kind of a law of attraction type um, principle, but obviously the energy that we put out is the energy that we'll get back, i.e. what we reap, we will sow. So I think the key issue is to get yourself into a position whereby you're looking to heal and you intend to heal. And it's that intention behind wanting to heal that's going to put an energy out there that's then going to allow you to attract the types of resources that are then in alignment with who you are. So if you have lots of money and you can go into courses, then you'll start attracting therapists or coaches or what you need from that standpoint. However, if you're kind of lacking resources or you're not quite sure what you should be putting your kind of investment or your time into, or you have self-value, self-worth issues, then clearly this will then be stepped back and sliding scale from there. But if we can sort ourselves to a position whereby we're intending to heal and we're looking for resources, then those resources will be looking for us. And then you could find that in a video on TikTok. You could find that on YouTube. You could find that on a free bit of content that literally, I don't know, it comes on a um, advert in the middle of a TV program. And you're like, oh, that's my thing. But you'll get a feeling that then shows you that it's in alignment with who you are and it's something you should then pursue. And it's trusting that intuition or that inner teacher and guidance as to then direct you from that perspective. And then you get to the realms of trusting the process and how everything happens for you, not to you. And then it's trusting the universe to give you what you need in that moment. So I think that's the easiest way to, to go about it, really. And the, the, the first way to cast that line as you're trying to line, land the fish that is right for you is to approach search engines on things like Google. Mm -hmm. 
on YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram, all of the platforms. If you put in healing codependency, healing from trauma, healing, healing from CPTSD, you will get a return. And I know there is an algorithm behind that that will actually try and match something with your known search history, which means that it does have a relationship to what is best for you. Algorithms can be a problematic thing, but they can also be a very helpful tool. All the data that is collected upon about us also paves a path for those serendipitous events, for those things to find you. If you reach out, something will reach back to you, but it really is, we have to be, as I was talking to Jacob about the other day, we have to be our own catalyst. And that's what we're talking about is taking that first step forward and not giving up on yourself because the hardest thing about healing is that we want it to be a six week crash course. I am all better. And that is not how it works. But the tools that you acquire over time will help you develop more finesse and nuance in dealing with yourself and having better and better outcomes. Hey, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. There is going to be a link in the description box below on the podcast episode, and I'll try and make sure I get it in on the YouTube as well for your various social links. But can you please tell my audience where people can find you? Yeah, so the main website is Physical Finesse, so that's F-I-N-E-S-S-E dot -S -S -E com. Um, you can obviously book a discovery call if you want to even start exploring. That's free and that's 30 to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, you can visit me on Penn site or you can go to any of my um, kind of uh, socials, which is TikTok, uh, Instagram, and there's a bit on YouTube and they're all under Physical Finesse. So if you um, search those, then you should be able to find out exactly where i am from there really so um and you do work hopefully. with people remotely correct you because you you are obviously yep. not in the same country that i am so we are working remotely together today but you do work yep. with clients remotely as well correct yeah there's no change of impact there's no um kind of distance sort of variations it's like the the work that we would do um can work literally remotely and from anywhere so as long as you're willing to do the healing work and you're putting in the time and you're starting your journey and your own personal development then that's all you technically need and then you're just going to align with um, exactly what you need from that perspective. I'm going to take one moment to talk a little bit about remote versus in-person healing and or tarot work or anything else. People are very convinced that being in person with somebody will give them a better result. It is actually almost the opposite and here is why. Mm -hmm. When you see somebody in person, we all have our defense systems that protect us as we go through the world. If you see somebody in person, a, a percentage of their energy, and it's usually not a small percentage, goes towards overcoming the natural defenses we have as we approach another person when they could physically impact us and therefore our feeling of safety has to be reinforced. I actually get incredibly clear readings for people online and it can often be much easier in a remote capacity than it is in somebody being in my office because I am not a particularly big person and it's not that my clients are giants, but honest to goodness, a lot of my energy in person goes towards overcoming that natural and warranted defense system. There's not a darn thing wrong with that defense system. Having your guard up appropriately is one of the things that will keep you safe in your walk through the world. But remember that when you're talking about dealing with a healer or a therapist remotely, it is not a lesser form of healing and in fact can have greater and swifter results because the person is not overcoming your defense system. Okay, guys, that was our episode for today with Chris Papperme, which I, I think I've conquered <laughs> pronouncing your name. I certainly have tried. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Guys, please check him out. He is clearly somebody who has done the work and knows what he's talking about. He has actual certifications. I'm always urging people to go towards people who have done the background research in order to be able to give you the best care and the best results from that care. Thank you again, Chris. Take care. Be well. Great. Thanks.